Welcome to the Tidewater Diaries. This episode, we're going all the way to Isla Mirada, Florida. We're gonna visit Nick Stanzett, the swordfish guru, right there at Bud Mary's Marina. But before I get started, they all get started right here in Citrus County. I'm here today in Homosassa, Florida at the Florida Cracker Monkey Bar. Just tied my skiff up. I'm gonna go inside and get an appetizer and a cold brew. Come with me. Today, we're at Bud and Mary's Marina right here in beautiful Isla Mirada, Florida, and we're talking with swordfish guru, Captain Nick Stanzik. Come along. Captain Nick. How you doing? Welcome to the Tidewater Diaries. I've got a lot of questions for you. Pleasure to be here. Well, I'll tell you what. Doing research on you is easy because your your butt is all over. Your mug is all over social media, YouTube. It, it's incredible. Here, I just knew you as a teammate of mine at Smith Optics, never realizing how, you know, now your dad, everyone knows your dad's a living legend. And I would think it would be pretty tough to get out of the shadow of someone that has that big a reputation, but by golly, you did it. <laughs> you have done it at a whole nother level with the Stans Family YouTube channel. It's incredible. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, it really is. We got a lot of questions, a lot of stuff I wanna go over with you. I'm gonna change into some, some glasses where I can actually read instead of my sunglasses here, but, and let's talk a little bit about, you know, you as a swordfish guru because that's what everyone, that's how you made your bones to get started. Yeah. And then this YouTube thing came up and it's been amazing. Thank it's, you. It's really engaging. So I guess the first thing I start with you about is the history of Bud and Mary's Marina because this is an iconic place, but it's it's got quite the history. I mean, it goes further back than even when he, your dad purchased it. It does, yeah. So tell me about that. That'd be a good launching point. Yeah. So my dad grew up in Miami. He was born in Missouri. He moved to Miami when I think three or four years old. And he loved fishing. His grandfather got him to fishing. And in 1978, he came down here and bought the marina, which the marina was already around for since 1944. So, you know, over 30 years prior to oh, that, wow. it was already established and, you know, kind of a destination for people to go and to fish. And a lot of famous people fished here, you know, whether it was presidents of the United States, baseball players like Ted Williams. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was born in 1985, so I'm 38 years old now and just kind of grew up here around the marina. I have an older brother. Uh, he's three years older than me and just grew up on the docks here fishing as little kids and then eventually out on boats and kind of doing my own thing now. I'll tell you what. Was it always the path? Because I know you went to the University of Miami and... You know, you go off to school. I'm sure you have 
oh, you know, I want to do something else. I want to make my own way. Sure. Did that ever cross your mind or did you know, did you know you were going to be here and you were going to be a Keys kid and you were going to turn into a professional guide? I always figured I would fish, you know, but as a little kid, my dream was to have like a fishing TV show. You know, I grew mm -hmm. up watching them, used to love watching them. And then uh, I went to college to University of Miami when I was 18. And at first I wanted to be a marine scientist, marine biologist. Mm -hmm. Did that for a couple of weeks and realized it wasn't going on a boat and going fishing and having fun. You know, there's a lot of science to it. So I switched gears and wound up uh, transferring into the School of Communication there and got a video and film degree. So it was half, uh, like half TV broadcast and half filmmaking, a little combination of both, and had a minor in photography, or second major technically, you know, photography. And I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with it, but I went up finishing some school and came back, you know, on weekends, I always came down here and I worked. Mm -hmm. I worked throughout college. I would come down on weekends on summer break, winter break. Got my captain's license that summer I was 18 and right out of high school and I would run charters and work. And then uh, after college, I came back, started fishing here a little bit and decided I wanna do some traveling. So I got a job on, as a mate on a big private boat, a 65 foot Viking and had that job for three or four months. Um, we went to the Bahamas, went down to Mexico, fishing, whether it was sailfish, blue marlin, dolphin. But it was a lot of waxing, a lot of boat maintenance with not as much fishing as I wanted to do. So. I was probably there five or six months and I put in my notice and I said, you know what, I want to get a job where I fish more. My dad didn't really want me to leave. He, you know, liked me being around because mm -hmm. we, we fished in, in college. Growing up, we fished together all the time with him and my uncle. He never really the two who taught me how to fish. Um, but I came back, started running the charter boat. My dad owned a couple boats here. And to that, then I got a different job, uh, which was two years on and off. It'd be a month or two on, a month off traveling. and. Did that for a couple of years and then decided I want to just go charter fishing full time. So I moved back here and I wasn't traveling as much. Met my wife the following year and been with her a long time and kind of built up my charter business. And over the years, it turned into a lot more than just charter fishing. Uh, now it's a lot of social media, whether it's YouTube mm -hmm. or Instagram and Facebook, uh, endorsements and partnerships with other companies and trying to make my own, uh, you know, my own niche and I guess my name in the industry. Well, when I first walked in, I said, you know, it's always a challenge when you have a dad that has a reputation like your father does. I mean, he's one of the names down here that has been emboldened in history for a long time with the sword fishing stuff, the marina here. And he's, he's quite a character, too. I mean, he's very outspoken. Sure. And he's just one of those people that if you don't know him, you're going to know him. <laughs> and yeah. I, and and I wasn't kidding, it's, it's kind of tough to get out from underneath the shade of a personality like that, but somehow you have managed that. You have definitely done that. Yeah, you know, an ego is not a good thing to have. I think most fishermen have egos. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, we probably, you know, my dad and I were a lot alike in a lot of ways, and that's why we kind of butt heads in the business side of things, but that's why I'm out there doing my own thing. Um, and he's, you know, here at the Marina Stell, and hopefully one day my brother and I will take it over. But uh, as a kid, you do want to get out from your, you know, father's yeah. shadow, your family's shadow, and kind of make your own name. And you know, a little bit of that's probably ego, but I just don't. I don't think any. I mean, a lot. There's a when you go earn something and do something, you know, different, and compared to being handed something like, you know, oh here's a business, go take it over. It's not as rewarding, you know. So it's like. Let me go try to do something I never did before. Let me put my college education to use and chase that dream I had, you know, to have my own fishing show and be in control of that. And there was another reason, too. Uh, in high school, I had a really good friend named Nick Blitz, and we used to make some videos together, and we called it the Nick Outdoor Show. And he had kind of started it, honestly. And he's like, "Now nah, you should do it. Like, Let's do it together. So we'd film a few episodes, and we never did anything with them. They are homemade little fishing videos. And uh, I guess he was young, you know, he's... 20 years old, he lost his life. So I kind of stepped away from it for a few years. And I didn't film. And then one day I said, you know what, I want to do this. And I think about him all the time. That's part of the driving sort force. Of a, it's sort of that little grain of sand that got in the oyster and now it's turning into a pearl. Without a doubt. So yeah. that's part of the inspiration. And I have old video, you know, videos from 10, 15 years ago, you know, the Nick Outdoors show. And 
Yeah. I think about him all the time, and he was really a big factor in yeah. why, why and we he's do still, it. So. Yeah, and he's, he's still influencing what you do. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's all, I can tell it's a personal thing with you. I, your, your dad, with the reputation, and I, I do realize he was kind of a pioneer in this whole deal. Sure. Uh, you know, with the hand cranking of these, of these swordfish up from the time he was in Miami sure. to the time he came down here and bought the marine in the 70s. Uh, but your game is so much different. I mean, it is it is much much different. He was from the era with, you know, the I don't know the Merritt sport fishing boats and the Rybaviches and sure. uh, probably the Vikings later on. And here you are in a center console Freeman. You know, it's a totally it's like it's almost like a race car game now. It is. I mean, it, it's like it's it's much much different. Yeah, I I never thought I would have a boat like that. I have, and when I showed up with the first one, I guess it was January 2016, I think he, he said, what are you doing, you know? Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. He's used to old fiberglass boats with twin yeah. diesels going, you know, 15 knots, and a charter boat, you know, a fisherman's boat, and here we go. I found a way to buy something I probably shouldn't have bought, but uh, I think timing is everything in life, and uh, got in at the right time with some companies, and started, you know, working with them, and Eight, eight, eight and a half years later, here we are. Well, and and even though I pin you in this video as the swordfish guru, um, there are a lot of species that you chase. You actually fish out of another type of boat as well and do some backcountry fishing. What are some of the other offshore and inshore things that you do here. And I know right now your career is kind of on hold because Stan's family is doing so well in YouTube. Um, you took some time off because you had some surgery done and now you're feeling you know, like you sure. gotta get back into it. Yep. But, but what are some of the other targets that I, I'm gonna say just kind of trip your trigger and you're like, hey, today's a great day. It's dolphin season or whatever. What sure. are those fish? So. Like you mentioned, swordfish, that's what we're known for. That's mm -hmm. what I built my career off of. And uh, the daytime sword fishing thing, we should definitely uh, give that a little credit. Yeah. In the 90s. Part of your logo. Yep. In the uh, 90s, Dr. Ruben Hine of Venezuela was catching them deep dropping in the daytime. And mm -hmm. um, here in 2003, January, my dad and Uncle Scott and their friend Vic Gaspany, they caught one. January 2003 here, deep dropping. And everyone started nighttime fishing again. 99, 2000, and a swordfish was a very elusive fish. My dad had caught him in the late 70s as well in Miami, so he's had a long history with them. But I became fascinated with them. Uh, you know, we were catching them at night, and in 2006 was the first one I saw caught in the daytime. We caught all of rod and reel. We caught two that day. We caught two that night, so we caught four swordfish on rod and reel, which was like incredible. Mm -hmm. And I was in college then, in college back then, Coming back and forth on the weekends, we'd fish a day or two week with my dad, and spent countless hours and time and money and fuel rigging baits to learn to try to how to perfect it. And we're still perfecting it. We've gotten a lot better at it, you know, the last 15 years. But uh, that's what kind of made my name. So we would go from there. But like you said, there's a lot of other species and other fish that I love to catch. Um, we don't, our fishery has changed here like it has a lot of Everywhere. places. So. Yeah. The last 10, 15, 20 years has changed drastically, but we used to catch a lot of big dolphin here, you know, mahi. We catch a few now, but it's not like it was 15 or 20 years ago. But Yeah, I, I'm looking at the <laughs> pictures on the wall. It's unbelievable the size of some of these dolphins. People are hugging them. Sure, yep. You know, it's 30, 40 pound bulls, you know, are bigger mm -hmm. occasionally. We're a, a fairly common catch now. They're very rare, honestly, and hopefully it'll get better in time. But I loved everything from sailfish, dolphin, snapper, grouper. Um, I got into deep dropping bottom fishing about 10 years ago and mm -hmm. I think for me you do something for a while and eventually you kind of get maybe a little bored with it so then you want to change it up and do something different you know try to perfect it mm -hmm. so we were doing the swordfish thing then I started bottom fishing catching like barrel fish and queen snapper and golden tile fish like species I'd never caught before and that became my niche for my charter business it was doing something a little different than what everybody else was doing you know so there's 15 charters going offshore here in a day. 14 of them are gonna go for mahi, black fin tuna. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what about the one guy that's going for swordfish or queen snapper, or tilefish, you know, or snowy grouper. So that kind of was how I set myself apart was 
find a niche, kind of try to focus on that. And for I'm 30, so for 20 years I've had my captain's license and have done charters, you know, full time for 15 years. But the last few years, as I started doing more YouTube and some more social media stuff, I started, and I, I fished a little bit in the backcountry as a kid, but now when I'm taking my friends or family, I like exploring, I like going somewhere different. So whether it's catching, catching permit in the Gulf of Mexico or snook back in the Everglades, I like to mix it up a little bit. It's um, good for your channel. Exactly. It's show, awesome for your channel. Show something different. Um, so I would say for me, something that I haven't spent a lot of time at, I get a little bug for it. Cabrera snapper the last four years. Yeah. I had, I had no, never thought about them before. Then about four years ago, I had some friends catching a few of them. I was like, you know, I want to try that. And we caught a couple the first couple of years, but the sharks got so bad, they would eat a lot of them. And it was really frustrating. You keep thinking, well, they, they can't eat another one. You hook another one, they eat it. And we caught some by them, but this year we had, two, I went five times this year. The first three trips, I didn't catch a fish. But the last two nights, we caught nine one night and seven one night, and we released most of the fish. We kept a couple to eat. But everyone said, oh, that's so cool. But they don't realize I fished four years, you know, 20 nights, 25, 30 nights yeah. to have those two incredible days, you know, where we catch nine Canberra snappers and then seven the next night. And sharks got a couple, but they weren't that bad, which was good. You know, it's obviously we hate feeding fish to sharks. But uh, I just get these little bugs in my system. It's like, you know what? Here's a new species. Let's go target it. Let's do it. Challenges, so. hurdles. Sure. You're, you're, all, you're always trying to reinvent yourself. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, you're a girl dad, so you got, you got two young daughters, um, and you have your wife, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. You've included them. So we're a lot of guys at your level and having the opportunity um, to be a part of a marina like this would have a YouTube channel that would just kind of focus on what they do. Sure. Yours is a little bit different. You've included your family, your girls are in it, your wife's in a lot of these videos. And I think that's what makes you like really a relatable guy. Uh, people see themselves as you. You're, sure. You do a good job of being a family man on this thing and not being the kind of alpha personality that now you do get excited and oh, by yeah. the way you talk way too fast i'm trying to talk, i'm trying to talk slow so hopefully i'm talking slow enough for everybody to understand you're doing you're doing a good job for oh, us thank you. But, i'm trying but um but yeah the tell it tell us more about the youtube channel because it's got one hell of a following it's it's amazing how fast it's grown so we started on youtube just over five years ago um i had never known anyone that had done it and actually made a living doing it. And two people really encouraged me to do it. And I think like in life, a lot of people, they don't mind they see you do okay, but a lot of people don't want to see you do better than them, you know, but a couple of people are like, Nick, you should really try it. You know, you live a interesting life. You do a lot of exciting stuff. Yeah. And one was Robert with Deer Meat for Dinner. Mm -hmm. and he has a huge Robert channel. Yeah, I know so him. that was great. And then another kid was uh, Franklin. He has a channel called Raw Fishing. And those were two guys that were really open with me, like told me, you know, like you potentially could do this, you know, and, make a better living than you're making and it was kind of like a it was a dream to have that fishing tv show as a yeah. kid and i said this is it this is my shot and you're in control of it the harder that you work at it you know the better shot you got and there's no guarantee you're gonna make it mm -hmm. but uh it's been fun and it was a nice uh i don't want to say i got burned out on fishing but it wasn't as enjoyable as it used to be and part of that would be having kids at home mm -hmm. um there's only tw there's only so many hours in a day you know something's gonna give so I couldn't fish like I was. So you know what? Maybe I can do this. I can make up for some of that. I won't fish quite as much, and have two little girls, and they both like to fish. They do get seasick, unfortunately, but uh, they love swimming. They love snorkeling, diving. They just took them out to the lighthouse this summer a couple of times. We just went to the Bahamas, and they had a blast. But uh, yeah, just those guys kind of gave me an idea. You know, trying to start YouTube, and it's. And here you are five years later, yeah. you're one of the most watched YouTube channels. I mean, as far as fishing goes. Sure. Um, but you incorporate all kinds of stuff in it. You incorporate, I saw some stuff that where you were shrimping in South Carolina, you were halibut fishing in Alaska. Um, like you said, you just you just went to the Bahamas, yeah. you did some dove hunting. Sure. I mean, you're, you're kind of doing everything. And the cooking aspect, even though you say, well, I'm not really a cook sure. or a chef or anything like that, but I do like to eat, which oh, yeah. you'd never know by the size of you <laughs> that you like to eat that much. But you, you guys do a fantastic job with that. Thank you. You really it. do a good job with that. Yeah, I think it would be 
the YouTube, what's great about that is the show, like anybody can go out there fishing and it may not be on a 42 foot frame, but if you have a boat or if you can even fish off a bridge, you might go catch a snapper, do something with the family and then take it home and cook and have a great meal and make that memory. And that's what I grew up with my dad doing. And I have all my memories are based around fishing. That's what my life was. Right. You know, and it still is. So it kind of, you know, you're, I like to share those experiences, maybe talk some other, you know, show what we do to another kid that maybe that could be something he does with his family, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's a daughter or a son, and they could have some of the same memories and experiences that we had, you know, something very similar and get him outside, get him outdoors and, you know, go have some fun on the boat like I did. Well, you make it attainable and you make it seem very easy. N naturally, there's a, there's a lot of natural skill there because you grew up in this business. So sure. to you, it's intuitive you know, how you position boats, how, you, how you, you make a decision based off weather, currents, whatever. Right. Um, I think all of us that are watermen and very engaged in the, in the natural world, I think there are a lot of guys like that. I've, I've done some pretty incredible Tidewater Diary interviews, like Carter Andrews, just some of the stuff that Carter has done is just, he, he lives the life of an explorer. He's almost like yeah. Ponce de Leon or something, <laughs> just in a bigger version. And then you sit down and you, t you talk with someone who's lived the life as long as your dad has, like Flip Pallet, and who's, who's very versed in, in fishing, but even maybe more versed in hunting, actually. Uh, and these are interesting characters. And, and a lot of people watch the Tidewater Diaries to see guys like that. And then when the opportunity came up uh, with a mutual friend of ours, Brandon Linder, who He's been on the Tidewater Diaries, professional athlete. I told him, I was like, I'd really like to, to do an interview with Nick Stanzik uh, because it would be something kind of outside my genre that I'm used to doing. And I go to the Keys all the time. I'm, I stay down the street from where his marina is. I should just call. He goes, oh, I know him personally. I'm just, he goes, I'll, I'll call him and tell him you're going to call him. Yeah. I was like, okay. He goes, I got his number. And he sent me your contact information that's like that. And that's yep. when I emailed you. Perfect. So uh, even though you and I share some common team pro staff positions with Smith Optics sure. and with Yeti and, and companies like that and PowerPole, uh, that, that is, you know, having those, those relationships with other folks is really what put us together. Definitely. And uh, I got a feeling that this interview with you is going to do just as well as Carter's <laughs> and Flip's, honestly. Even as young as you are, I mean, I think it will because you appeal to everybody. Your 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 scope of appeal isn't narrow; it's so wide because you do so much. So guys my age True. love to watch your stuff, and kids love to watch your stuff. And now you know you. Because you're the girl dad and you, and, you, and you got your wife with you all the time, I think a lot of family guys are, and, and even female anglers are sure. tuned in to Nick Stanzik. We're trying. You're doing a good job. You're really doing a good job. You know, we talk about Brandon being a professional athlete. I know you probably have had some pretty impressive names aboard your boat. But... Uh, but one in particular that I watched because I'm a big country music fan was I saw that Ronnie Dunn brought his grandkids and his son out with you. And I thought that was a, that was a pretty cool video. You guys caught the queen snapper and everything sure. like that. How is it having people that you marvel at, you're thinking this guy is a, he's in the Country Music Hall of Fame. And he, he's one of these guys who's, who's basically a global star. And now he's fishing with, with Nick on a boat in right. his backyard. It's it's cool, you know, like, yeah, I do love fishing, you know, famous people and all that stuff mm -hmm. and whatnot, people that you look up to, you know, you've always been a fan of. Yeah. But I will say too, fishing a little kid that's coming out there with his family for the first time and is excited, I get as much enjoyment as that being a charter captain. But like when we fished with Ronnie recently, that was this past summer, super nice guy, would never know, you know, like no ego, nothing like that. And yeah. It was, it was for his grandson, you know, it was really, he wanted to see his grandson have a good time. And the grandson caught the biggest fish of the day, a big yellow edge grouper. And, uh, yeah, I saw and that. I was like that, having that, that was impressive. the trip with your family there and making some memories. And it was, you would never know who he is. You know, I fish multiple athletes and most of the time the people are down to earth, but obviously there's a few people you fish that 
I won't be taking that guy <laughs> that guy again. So that does <laughs> happen, we, you know, that you spend we all, with. We, we all run into that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, so, but over, no, it's, it's awesome, though, you know. He was a friend of my dad's friend, Ron Madra, who's a, uh, was a sports photographer for 35, 40 years. And he did a lot of stuff with uh, country music artists as well, uh, cover shots and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that's how we kind of put that together. So, you know what, we'll take them. And I haven't been fishing as much, uh, you know, just a little complication from sur basic surgery 18 months ago, put me in some chronic pain, so I've been dealing with that. But I said, you know what, I'll take Ronnie out that day to do it. And hopefully, you know, I'll get back into chartering more here in the next few months. But uh, yeah, I know, I know your, uh, your sword it. fishing camps are hugely popular. Sure. And I know you want to get back to getting those cranked up again as well. Definitely. Um, before, we really want you to kind of show us the marina. It's beautiful out there. I mean, the tarpon rolling in, the, in this place, and you've got nurse sharks swimming around everywhere. And give us kind of a feel, because this is such an iconic spot. But we really want to see your, your Freeman and some of your tackle stuff as well. So we'll go out there in a minute. But i got to ask you, because I did watch the video where you caught, I'm guessing that had to be your largest swordfish. Now I know I, I, I've I've watched stuff where your dad's talked about his largest swordfish, and I know he considers electric reel stuff cheating and things like that. Yeah. But 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 it's a different era now, sure. and, and there's fewer fish, so you got to do what you got to do. But how big was that swordfish? I mean, it it looks so massive. I didn't even think you were going to get the <laughs> damn thing in the boat. We got lucky to catch that one. It would be that swordfish for me. I'd. I've seen over 2,000 swordfish caught. Mm -hmm. So you're talking, you know, one swordfish was 757 pounds. We fought it eight hours. But that was the defining moment, you know, in my career, in my lifetime, or probably whatnot. Like, you know, if I die, like, hey, I still got that. You know, everybody talked about that fish, and they say it broke, yeah. it broke the internet, you know, when it kind of caught it and whatnot. And just to have the potential to go off of South Florida and catch a 700 plus pound swordfish was like incredible, you know. And um, it was a big fish. It was, it was a very exciting. We had lost so many big swordfish over the years. Like yeah. it, it took me, I'd caught 200 swordfish before I ever caught a 400 pounder. I mean, take the average person, say you fished swordfish 10 times a year and you caught one, half your trip's five a year. I mean, you'd fish in 10 years, you only catch 50 swordfish. It could take you 40 years to catch a 400 yeah, pounder. You probably likely will never catch. Correct. One. So to catch that one there was a special fish and it was the people's first time ever sword fishing, and they appreciated it. You know, they knew it was special and stuff like that. You know, they were fishermen as well, and uh, I just never, have never sword fished. They don't know sorts of types. So I, I will tell you this, Nick. When I watched that episode on Stan's family of that fish being caught, you could hear <laughs> not only the excitement in your voice, but the panic in your voice oh, not yeah. to let this thing get away. I'm, and, and when you have someone who's seasoned, who's seen it enough, to know that this is one of those moments in time that you absolutely positively cannot let it get away. I mean, you, your voice went up an octave. <laughs> you were talking even faster than you normally <laughs> talk. Yep. And it, it was, you could tell it was a moment. It was one of those moments and it was emblazoned in film now, in digital film. And everyone could go on the internet and see that now. Yeah. It, that, it was impressive. And that fish there, you know, get I get, a gaff in them anywhere. Get a gaff, oh yeah, anywhere. <laughs> and that fish, that's what those videos there is what really kickstarted the YouTube channel. You know, that gave us that first boost of energy because it was very slow growth and yeah. caught that big fish. And the videos, you know, went semi-viral. I wouldn't say 100% viral, but viral for me. You know, at the yeah. time, there's seven, eight hundred thousand views or whatever yeah. they were. And. Uh, that's what really kind of kickstarted the channel. I said, hey, maybe this will actually work out, you know, to do this. And because I had done YouTube, I hadn't made a dime from it. And yeah. pretty much the first year I did it, and you're spending, it's a full time job with, you know, no instant benefit, which right. that's like any business in life. You got to put your time in. Exactly. If you have the idea you're going to go out there and crush, like, sure, it happens out one out of a million people, but anything, whether you're doing, you know, construction or a charter business or YouTube or film, whatever any, it is. It's all like that. And it was, that was the, that was that tipping point for me where, hey, I am going to have a shot of this. And everything from there started going up, 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 up. And it was a big fish there. It was a, a lifetime fish. And we got them. And a little bit of luck was there behind us that day. I had uh, Connor Ross was with me as the mate. And he had never caught a swordfish. His dad's Paul Ross from the Relentless, mm -hmm. which is an, he's an incredible fisherman. Yeah. One of the best down here. And we kind of scrimped the bait on this morning. I'm like, just check the bait there. And 
the loop didn't go through the eye of the hook on the dolphin belly and it pulled through. I was like, ooh, good thing we checked that, you know? Yeah. And it would be that one little thing. If you didn't double check it, we wouldn't have caught that fish. That's right. Ten boats were fishing that day, but we were the first one there. We hooked the fish the first five minutes of the day. I didn't think we were fishing ten minutes, five minutes. And then, you know, all these other boats come and it was just the right spot at the right time. But And I had fished somebody the day before and they said, man, we missed that big fish by a day. I was like, I missed them by 15 years. You know, it wasn't just the one day that made the difference. It was being out there 15 years to have that opportunity. And it was kind of funny because there was another big fish caught that day, you know, over 500 pounds. I think it was like 526 pounds, 530 Still pounds. Still impressive. And I'm, we're, we catch this big giant fish. We fight it eight hours. You know, we drift 20 miles in the Gulf Stream fighting this thing and get in the boat. We're running home. And I start getting texts like, oh, you know, did you see these guys? They caught a nickel. They caught a 500 pounder. And I wrote back, like, and I knew our fish was over five, 600 pounds. I didn't know it was over 700. Like, what am I going to do? The guy's like, I don't know. So I start sending the picture of my fish. <laughs> Some of my friends are like, is that today? I'm like, yep. They're like, never mind. <laughs> and it was bad day to bad day to catch your biggest swordfish because you just got trumped by one over 200 pounds bigger. You know, yeah, 225 pounds the bigger. Same day. Same day, and uh, it was a lifetime fish, no doubt about it. And, I've hooked some other ones. We fought another one a couple years later for seven hours. We, we broke the line on 10 feet from the leader, and we had him on the leader 10 times. I don't know how big he was, if he was bigger or not, but I've lost my share of big ones. So yeah. it was. I was glad the one stayed on there. You deserved we got him, it. So. I yeah. like to think so, yeah. We put our time in. So. And, I, and, and the Stanzik name, again, goes another generation <laughs> with a... With, with a fish that met... Because your, your dad <laughs> has caught some pretty big fish. He's caught big fish, and he's had a... You know, he's done a lot of different types of fishing in his life, you know. Whether it was bone fishing with a fly rod, he used to love to do that. And they, mm -hmm. him and Vic chased the record. I see that. The record too. bone fish, that, I think that was a record for 13 years. And um, it did get broken. They don't... They're That's gut. what they're meant to be. Yeah. Records are supposed to be broken. Yeah, well, he will say he doesn't think the fish that beat it was bigger. <laughs> um, you know, because it was caught. And not to say there's not a few big fish caught in the Bahamas. There is, yeah. but some of these places in the world, unfortunately... May uh, a fish could be, if it's shorter and not as fat, it probably ain't as big, you know, as a right. general rule. But a lot of these places around the world, you know, they wanted to increase tourism and stuff like that. That's so right. So they may a have kind of embellishing. Exactly. So maybe a little embellishing, and you know, hopefully that's not the case. But you never yeah. know. But uh, he bone fished for years. He sail fished in Mexico for years with a fly rod. Blue marlin fish. Then the sword fishing was something for 12, uh, you, 15 years. You just look up on this wall of your your father i mean these are some incredible fish that he's been a part of for and sure like you said, they're memories yeah and he so him and my brother i fished with my dad sword fishing for 10 or 12 years all the time mm -hmm. and growing up we fished together a lot my brother didn't fish as much when he was younger but the last 10 or 12 years my dad has spent more time with him fishing mm -hmm. and my brother got into the backcountry snook redfish permit tarpon. trout tarpon all that stuff and they do that a lot now they fish together at least once a week sometimes twice a week um I spent my, my share of long, slow boat, rough rides, sword fishing with them, you know, yeah. 15 years in a row. So we did that a lot. And that was our thing. And now I kind of took the reins over in that and yeah. kind of built my business on it. And we fish together occasionally um, nowadays. And hopefully, as years come in, I have the, and my dad has four grandchildren. My brother has two boys. I have two girls. Hopefully, we can do some family trips, you know, the next few years coming up and right. get together out there as a family and make some more memories. That's right. That's what it's really about. No doubt. I think uh, I think you've you've satisfied the Nick Outdoors <laughs> legacy with what, you, what with what you've accomplished. But I'd sure like for you to walk us around the piers and and the docks here and show us because you got a lot of captains that work out of here and kind of okay. give us a, a tour of what Bud and Mary's you know this iconic marina is all about. Let's and then if you out. don't mind, we'd love to jump on your brand new Freeman <laughs> and see uh, see some of your gear and um, maybe chit chat about that and then take you to lunch for all your trouble. I'm in. All right, let's go. So the tackle and retail store is up here in the front? Yep, so this is the main office where we book all the charters, all the hotel rooms, and there's a little deli here. They make breakfast and sandwiches for all the captains and mates, all the charter guests, and they make pretty good little food there. And you've got a feed the tarpon zone here, and then all the backcountry boats are back underneath here, right? Yep, so there's 24 inshore guides right here. They do all the backcountry shallow water trips. And we got all of our offshore boats out here on the main docks. I can see, and you've got quite a number of guides that work out of here. How many? 
There's 17 offshore boats, there's 24 inshore boats, there's a head boat, and there's a dive boat, which is a separate business. And I guess that's uh, 24 and 17 is 41 plus that. And there's a few guys that come in and out on the day, so about 45 captains here. Wow, that's big. And the iconic signage, because you got motel rooms here, you know, with the Bud and Mary's uh, painted marine sign there that everyone sees as they come across the bridge. I mean, the big sport fishing sign here, it's just one of those places that is a destination. Definitely, and it hasn't changed too much yet. You know, the keys have changed a lot the last 20, 30, they 40 sure years, have. but we still hear all the time that we still have that old school feeling here. And you sure do. It's still a fishing marina, you know? You sure do. So I see there's a Freeman here, but this looks like your older boat. You just got a brand new one. And where's that one? So this is the 42 footer that we got listed for sale. Hopefully we got a buyer for it. And the brand new 42 is down there, so let's go check it out. Yeah, let's do it. Whew, boy, what a gorgeous, gorgeous boat. Thank you. I mean, and it's the same size as your previous Freeman, but this one here, well, <laughs> she looks like she's had a facelift. Yep, brand new, two weeks old and ready to go catch some fish on her. What have you done with her so far? We went to the Bahamas last week. We took the family over there. We speared a bunch of hogfish, a couple of really big lobsters, um, caught some deep drop fish on it, some snappers and whatnot. And Mike did his first charter on it yesterday. He caught a bunch of blackfin tuna, big mutton snapper, a few yellowtails, and hopefully we'll catch a swordfish on it soon. Well, I'll try not to hit my head here. Show us around, tell me what you got on this thing. Oh, come check it out. No shortage of rod holders. <laughs> nope. So this is a 2024 model, 42 foot Freeman. It's the fourth Freeman I've had. I've had wow. uh, two 37s, and now this is my second 42. And but right next to us is the boat I started charter fishing on. So I want to make sure everybody knows that we didn't always have these big, go fast, fancy center consoles. Like this is a 34 foot Crusader with twin. The past, the future. Yep. The past, the present, the future, no doubt. And that's where I grew up fishing on, though. Caught lots of swordfish on that boat and spent a lot of years on there. And that was a fisherman's boat. And this is the entertainer's boat and the <laughs> entrepreneur. So there you go. What a gorgeous piece of equipment this is. So under here, what's here? Coffin so this fish is the, boxes? Yep. So coffin box here, two 400 quart insulated fish boxes. I usually use one side for fish, the other side for storage. Say you're going to Louisiana or the Carolinas and you know, you're catching eight, 10 big elephant tunas a day. Sure, you can use both sides, but mm -hmm. here with the black fins and mahis, one side is plenty big enough. You now you can still get three, 400 pounds of fish on one side of it. But we got that up here, like the big lounger coffin box. Plenty of storage on the catamaran. You got hatches in both sponsons, whether it's your anchors, your life jackets, tackle. We got a killer sound system well, on here. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, there's speakers everywhere. This fusion setup is beautiful. Yep, so we just got that on here. And I, it was funny because my first Freeman was a 37 with twin 350 Yamahas. And uh, looking back, I would say it was like the poor man's Freeman. It was what I could afford at the time. I had ordered a 34 footer, was waiting on that three months past. They talked me into getting a 37 and it was a lot more money. You know, it was a yeah. hundred grand more. I was like, eh, I can't really afford that. I was like, think about it. And I guess to kind of, to get something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. So That's right. had to find a different way to afford it and make do. And my dad was about to have a heart attack when I showed up with a, 37 foot center console with twin 350 outboards and caught a lot of great fish on that. That's what we caught that 757 pound swordfish on. Wow. And, uh, you know, I was doing 200 trips a year on it when I got it. So had that for a lot of years and it's still over here. My friends own it now, but I still kind of help uh, manage mm -hmm. it and take care of it a little bit for them. But this is the new one, quad 300s. Walk back here and check out your console oh, and yeah. then check out the business end of this where all the propulsion is. So the first thing you notice is we got a pair of 24 inch MFDs. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're kind of like TV screens. They are. This is like a spaceship, you know, compared to what I grew up fishing on. And no doubt. These seats. I got five captain's chairs, two on shock suspension. So when you're running, you know, they move up and down with air cushion underneath them. Not only above my pay grade, it's above <laughs> my skill level. I'm used to, I'm excited about going home and getting in my little Eldora skiff with my tiller handle. This is crazy. Well, and more fusion speakers. Oh yeah, lots of speakers, a good <laughs> sound system, and four big livels on the boat. So you got two 70-gallon livels in the deck, a pair of 50 gallons up top, 
four 300 Yamahas on the back, so it moves right along. And like you said, tons of rod holders, never a shortage on them. And we even got a tower on it in case we're sight fishing yeah, for sailfish nice or mahi, top on it. cobia, all that stuff. And, and I see you got your electric reels back here. Yep, we got a couple of swordfish rods back here. And like you said earlier, 80s. You know, my dad, yeah. he hates electric reels. He doesn't like them. And they're not as sporting as hand cranking. You know, it would be like, I would say if you were a hunter, you know, if you got to go hunting one day a year, you're probably going to use a gun. But if you got the chance to go all the time, maybe use a bow, you know, and That's right. stuff like that. So it gives you a little better shot. It takes out a little bit of a human angling error. But the challenge for me is going out there to 1,500 or 2,000 feet of water, finding the fish, hooking the fish, you know, with two to 3,000 feet of line out. If the current's going four knots, you could have a 12 pound lead on there. You could have three to 4,000 feet of line out because all the scope in it. Oh yeah. So the electric reel is part of it, it makes it a little bit easier. But say you want to hand crank one, you know, and you want to do it mono e mono. This system here, you push Just these two pins, out. it disengages, pops out. Now you got a regular rod and reel and you can still catch them old school style. Traditionally. And whether we're doing stand up, putting a rod in a holder, you know, there's options for everybody. And, you do have to be in good shape to, to do catch this. a swordfish from 1,500, 2,000 feet of water. But these are some of the reels we use and some of the rods that we designed and kind of perfected over the years. You know, the action that we wanted with the rod tip, depending on how much weight you have to use and all that. So, so you have a little more of a high-tech light attractor. It's not a Siloom stick that you have at the business end of this. What's that deal with that? So, you know, at nighttime you could use a Siloom stick, you know, to put some light by the bait there to get the fish's attention. but the daytime, unless you have a super duper heavy duty you know, asylum stick, they crack under pressure, they break, so it wouldn't help attract the fish to it. So these are deep water lights that can take the pressure up to, you know, 3,000 feet, oh, wow. which we're not usually that deep, but they're water activated. They blink when they uh, hit the water there and turn on, and a couple of those to get the fish's attention and draw them in. What a beautiful boat. I mean, Thank it's you. gorgeous. I can, I can see, uh why there's a, an affinity for this amongst the billfish and offshore crowd because these these boats do what they're supposed to as advertised what 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 can you cruise at with this you know billy freeman and his team you know he, he did a great job designing the boat and building them and making them comfortable where you could run my dad you know when he finally went on my 37 back then this ride's even better so 42 you know he looks at me and he's like ah i see it. now he has a 54 foot blackwell but yeah. This boat rides better than his boat does, you know? Wow. But uh, this boat will go 65 miles an hour. You could cruise at 45 miles an hour easily. Charter fishing, if you burned all your fuel, you wouldn't make any money. So usually we cruise at 40 miles an hour. Yeah. And for a boat with four engines that's 42 feet long, we're getting 0.8 to 0.9 miles per gallon. If it's calm and light, we'll get a mile per gallon, which this may not be good compared to a skiff, you know, a 17 yeah, foot skiff. Yeah, but, but still To have six, eight, six to eight people on here in the comfort to get, you know, 0.9 miles per gallon is really impressive in my opinion. Yeah, it you know? is. And you're going 40, 45 miles an hour, so. And you can run in some seas in this thing and it, it, you're on a cushion of air. Without a doubt, you know, and if it's rough, it's still rough in any boat, but it could be three to four footers and you're comfortable. You're not beat up when you come in from fishing. My back used to bother me on the old boat, you know, rocking and rolling all day long. But on here now, you know, the last eight years I've been on these boats, I feel twice as good, you know, 10 times better than I used to feel. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's go get some lunch, Nick. I'm in. Lazy Days is right there. Yeah, this is one of my go-to restaurants here in the Keys. It's a must stop, no doubt about yeah, it. Lazy Days is just one yes. of those spots that everyone loves coming to for that Lazy Days style fish. Well, I think we pit maybe one of the best lunch spots in the Florida Keys, especially in Isla Mirada. But I was really impressed with Bud and Mary's. I mean, you guys got quite the operation. I talk about being wowed. And the Freeman boat, you got to be proud of that just getting it. Yep, thank you. I never thought we'd be there, but we're, we're there now. we we'll are hopefully keep going up and keep working on it. And I, I, I wish you much success with the Stan Spam YouTube channel. But I don't think I need to, to give you too much encouragement because what you're doing is working. It's doing a great job. You got a great brand. You got a great family. Thank you. Life doesn't get better than that. We're happy. No complaints. I think Nick Outdoors would be proud of you. 
No doubt. Yep, this one's for him. That's right. <laughs>